And because He first loved us, we love Him. And because He has placed that love within us, we in turn can love each other, love other people. And around here we say we love everybody. And we tell people, nobody ever loved you like Jesus loved you. And that is absolutely true. Can I get an amen on that? Nobody ever loved us like Jesus loves us. And nobody, nobody ever gave us such great love as God did. And so we want to love others as well. I'm reminded of the fellow that was looking up when he was in the big city and way up on a construction site among the steel girders, oh, about 10 stories up, there was one of those cool as a cucumber uh, fellas working up there, way up there. I don't know if you've ever, I can't even think about being up there. But this iron worker was nonchalantly walking the beams high above the street in this skyscraper to be while the pneumatic hammers were making nerve jangling racket and the compressor below was shaking the whole steel structure. And when he came down, the fellow that was watching tapped him on the shoulder and said, I was totally amazed by your absolute calmness up there. How did you happen to, to go to work on a job like this? Well, said the iron worker, I used to drive a school bus, but my nerves gave out. And I'm thinking about all those school bus drivers and all those church bus drivers and all those Sunday school teachers and children's workers, and I want to give a shout out and a salute. You know, God loves you, and we love you, and we know you love those kids. Come on, let's give them a hand. Amen. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I, I've taught Sunday school classes, not just auditorium adult classes, but when we were in California for a period of time, all the Winnegars were teaching all the kids. We, I had a huge first through third grade class, and we would average close to 100. It would be 80, 90 in that class all the time. I had helpers, but I was teaching. And with that class, you know, we could part the Red Sea, and I could run, and I could bring them row by row down the Red Sea. You know, we could do all those things. And that's the way you've got to teach it larger than life. How many feel like you're there right now? Okay. Gwendolyn taught all of the fourth through sixth grade girls. And there was a mob of them. And, and Brad and Brett taught all of the fourth through sixth grade boys. And there was a group of them. We taught all the kids and just had a wonderful time. But here's something we learned. We learned that the worst behaved kids in your class are the ones with perfect attendance. Got some Sunday school teachers here, say Amen. Got some bus workers here say amen. You know what I'm saying. But that doesn't make us not love them. After all, God looked down at us. And He didn't love us because. He loved us in spite of. Love is expressed in many, many different ways. You see on the cover and on the inside of your bulletin a great picture about people praying for others. And the highest form of love that we can express in a tangible way is to pray for one another and pray for others and some that may not even want our prayers. This is the way that we show true godly love. On the front of your prayer bulletin today, we have again the words of Samuel, the prophet who was rejected by God's people. And no doubt at the time that he said this and it's recorded, by inspiration, he was hurting, he was going through something, disenfranchisement. If you've ever been put outside by people that you care about, or it really hurt deeply, you can identify with his farewell in which he said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. You say, that's not the last words I said before I went out the door with such and so. But that should be the highest form of love, even when we're rejected. We should pray for people. We should love people. That's true love. When you're rejected, when you're hurting, praying for those that have injured you. Think about Jesus Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But if I can take you back 2,000 years and take you to that scene, a real-life 
seen on Golgotha's brow. We have Jesus Christ on the center cross and spikes running just at the base of the hand, not in the palms as you erroneously see because that would you tear that loose with the weight of the body. So propped right between the bones because no bones were broken. He's hanging there in absolute agony. His lungs are filling up with his own fluid. People who were crucified frequently die. They expired as a result of drowning in their own fluid. Jesus did not. He dismissed his spirit. But he's hanging there. And the way we read the text, he didn't just say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Hanging there, gasping for breath in his human body, feeling every pain, both physically and spiritually, that man has ever felt or experienced. He's saying as his fluid is filling his lungs, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Again, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Over and over and over for you and for me. He forgave us our sins. Put him on that cross. But love held him to that cross. As Stephen was being stoned as the first martyr. Those huge stones. Not little stones, but huge rocks. Crushing his bones. Crushing his skull. He looked up and he asked God not to charge it to their account. Paul. Likewise, abused, mistreated, never brought a railing against those that inflicted pain upon him for the cause of Christ. But he said that he, he just counted himself privileged to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ. And when he listed those things that he went through in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 2 Corinthians and uh, chapter 11, I feel so backslidden every time I read it. What he went through is so much contrast to how little we go through but he forgave them do we love people we don't like good question huh do we show God's love for them by praying for them the people that do you wrong the guy that treats you bad the the, the server in the restaurant that treat you badly they're just having a bad day and maybe maybe they've been kicked out of their home and they're trying to find a place to stay and they're just sleeping on somebody's floor right now till they can get into one of these overpriced apartments around here they're having a bad time they're having a bad day and maybe they didn't get any tips or maybe somebody shorted them and they're coming and they're kind of throwing stuff out. And you know what you do in a case like that? You think to yourself, that's somebody's son. That's somebody's daughter. I don't care what they look like. I don't care how they're treating me. I want to treat them like Jesus would treat them. And so you show them kindness and you show them love. And you might even pull out a big bill and say, listen, I'm going to tip you ahead of time. Because I know you're going to give me good service. And here's a gospel track with a smiley face on it. And you need one of those today. And you know what? I, I detect that maybe you're going through a hard time. And maybe this will put a smile on your face. And man, every time I get bad service, I just don't give them a tip. Yeah, let them go on to hell. Let them go on in their despair. and Let them experience the worst of all in a place called hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels. No, we need to love people that we don't even like. We need to pray for them and show the highest love. Paul, writing by inspiration in 1 Thessalonians. Yes, 1 Thessalonians. And chapter 1. Let's go back to verse 1. Paul and Silvanus, that's the long name for Silas and Timotheus, that's the fancy way of saying Timothy, Paul and Silas and Timothy, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice this, verse 2, we give thanks to God always for you. Making mention for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God 
and the Father. So who are these people, these Thessalonians? This is a, a nice expression, but who were these people? And what happened at Thessalonica? Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. We're going to go to several different places. I want you to take some notes today. And praise God at Thessalonica, which was there in what we would call Greece today. And there is, there is a place that's known as Saloniki, where Thessalonica was. There were some people saved, and they formed a church. But look how it came into being. In Acts chapter 17, verse number 1, Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went where the people were, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. That doesn't mean he was a Seventh-day Adventist. Now you'll hear Seventh-day Adventists say, Paul worshipped on Saturday. No, Paul went where the Jews were. And the Jews weren't going to be there on Sunday at 9.45 for Sunday school. They were there on Friday night through Saturday evening. That's it. That's when they were in the synagogue, the place where they would gather and discuss and have reading of Scripture and so forth. So he opened, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So they had a mixed multitude. Some were Jews and some were Greeks. And there were men and there were women. But the next word, the first word in verse 5 is what? The three-letter conjunction, but the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, saying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason, poor guy, and of the other, they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. They got them out of town. Who come... Coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, started all over again. Now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So they had a good, open reception in Berea, but not so much in Thessalonica. A mixed multitude, a church that was formed. It should have been in, Berea, in, in Thessalonica like it was in Berea. It was not. And yet Paul writes to them later, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, and remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and the Father. Am I going to only pray for people I like? Or am I going to pray for people that give me trouble? Hmm. Say, <clears throat> preacher, I don't care what you say. You don't know how I've been hurt. You don't know what I'm going through. No, I don't, but Jesus knows. And what did Jesus do? And we sing that chorus, To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. No, we don't really want to be like Jesus because we want to have all the freebies and the benefits. We want to go to heaven. We want to enjoy all the blessings. But we don't want to be like Jesus because Jesus would be saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Paul would be saying, don't put it on their account. Don't charge it against them. You say, I'm going to pray for people I like, and that's it. People that I already care for. Well, Jonah, I'm glad to meet you, you bigot. You anti-Assyrian. You hateful pragmatist Jonah, a preacher who ought to know better, trying to play God, making up your own rules as you go along. Glad to know you, Jonah, because he was just all of that, a bigot. And that's what we are. We're bigots against people who don't treat us nice when we don't show them God's love. Love is not God's love when it's just because of. Love is God's love when it's in spite of. I want you to go over to the little book known as Philippians. It's the 
the letter of the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. We have a similar greeting. Philippians chapter number 1. Paul and Timotheus, once again, the servants of Jesus Christ, all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops, that's the pastors, and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this greeting. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Man, that's great. I've got confidence that God's going to keep on working in and through you. Verse 7, even as it is meet or fitting for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. He's filled with love. So who are these Philippians? This is a nice little greeting, but who were they? Go back one chapter from where we were. Go to chapter 16 of the book of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 16. And I'll just summarize quickly. They come to a place because God has revealed to Paul that they need help over there. So he comes across into what is now Europe. And Philippi, named for the father of Alexander the Great, who was king before him. Philippi, uh, a city of Macedonia, northern Greece, which is heavily populated by a Roman garrison. So the Roman uh, presence is very obvious. He goes, he finds, he finds some women that are worshiping, but they hadn't built, you know, a place of worship. There weren't enough of them. And what does he do? He, he shows them Jesus. He wins Lydia and some other worshiping women, shows them the, the, the complete way, the way to Christ. And then they get followed around town by a soothsayer, a young girl who's filled with a demon. And finally they get aggravated and they cast out the demon. And so, of course, she can't tell fortunes anymore. She's not demonized anymore. And so they get mad and they throw him in jail. They don't ask him. They did not Mirandize Paul and Silas. They threw him into jail, put him in stocks. And instead of weeping and wailing, they're singing songs at midnight. And there is a tradition among the early church of the song that they were singing. It was all praise. They're singing praises to God. And all of a sudden that place starts to rock and reel. And an earthquake hits that place and everything kind of falls in. And their, their, their chains fall off. The lights go out. And the little jailer jumps in. He's got one of these little short stubby swords like this. They didn't have the big long ones. They had little short stubby ones. And he pulls it out. He's about ready to commit Harry Carey because the penalty for a jailer losing any prisoners was death. Paul says, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Takes the opportunity. I know he was a Baptist. To preach. I mean, lights were out, everything. The dust is rising. Can't you just see it? And the man falls down and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Hasn't changed. Still the same plan of salvation. And he got saved and his family and they got baptized. And now we have a nucleus of a church. The church at Philippi. But what a rough welcome to the city of Philippi when those officials found out that Paul was a citizen of Rome and had been denied his privileges as a citizen. They said, oh, you just leave town. You just leave quietly. Uh, let, we don't have to do anything. Just let's just... I know that Paul got all the mileage out of that one that he possibly could. But there was the nucleus of a church. Beaten, abused, mistreated, and yet when Paul writes... He says, in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy. There it is. What is your prayer life? What does my prayer life say about the depths of our spiritual maturity? Are we shallow? Do we say this? God bless mommy. God bless daddy. 
you know, now I lay me down to sleep. Polly want a cracker. What is our prayer life really like? Is it deep? Is it real? Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43, Jesus speaking, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's prevailing teaching at that time. That's what the religious leaders were teaching. Bad teaching. But I say unto you, Jesus says, and it's a command, Love your enemies. Look at me. Central Baptist Church. Look at me. Love your enemies. Quote, unquote. Jesus speaking. He's still speaking to us. After all these centuries, the inspired Word of God has not expired. It's still true. It's still powerful. Love thy enemies. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. It doesn't say you become children of the Father by doing this, but you know what? You're not ever going to give away the family resemblance until we do that. No one's going to get it. They're going to say, well, you know, they're real straight. They're real moralistic. They're real strict about their standards. But you know what? They don't like people very much. I've known Christians like that. We've even been guilty of being Christians like that from time to time. When someone walks through those doors or when you cross paths with them at the restaurant today or when you talk to them at work or when you're there in the neighborhood or out shopping sometime or wherever you may be, we are to love those who don't treat us right. We're to love them even if they don't like us. Four. What does it say here? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. I promise you that good people and unsaved people both got rained on today. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? The dishonest tax collectors would treat people they liked nicely. So we're no better than some dishonest crook, some crooked official. If we do that. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Well, you should salute your brethren, but more than that. Do not even the publicans so. Be ye therefore perfect. Not sinlessly perfect, but complete in the area of love. What does it take for us to be complete in love? Every single day, allowing Jesus Christ to be seen as the Spirit of God is controlling our life. We're full of the Holy Spirit and the, the Lord God is living out of us so that we touch the lives of others. How many of you have ever heard the name Elizabeth Elliot? Now, my generation is very familiar with her, with the books she wrote and with her speaking, famous lady. Maybe I'll refresh your memory when I say her young husband, Jim, died along with four others on the banks of a South American river in the mid-1950s. So young, so young they died. Trying to reach the Aka Indian tribe with the gospel. People said, what a waste. These bodies speared to death and beheaded and floating in the river. What a terrible waste. When the story was told again and again and again to American and British and European audiences, Thousands of young men and women stood up and said, I'll take their place. I'll take their place. And what about Elizabeth Elliot? She prayed for and ministered to her husband's murderers. And some of them became great Christians. So I don't know that I could do that. You and I cannot do that. Only by the grace of God can there be that kind of ministry. If your nation was one that had been overrun by a totalitarian army, maybe the Nazis, maybe the imperialist Japanese, 
See, I'll never forget them. Maybe, maybe, maybe the totalitarian Russians or the totalitarian Chinese. Maybe your family or maybe your loved ones suffered. I'll never forgive them. By the grace of God, we can and we must. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Let me bring it up contemporary. Let me bring it up to speed. Many of you have the same kind of feelings toward the whole Muslim community because of what ISIS and other extremist groups do. I want to tell you right now, unless we have the same heart toward them as God has toward them, our ministry will be, at best, a muted form of what it ought to be. Our sound will not be clear. Our love will not be experienced. The people that do us wrong, that hate us, and do terrible things, we have to remember what Jesus and Stephen and Paul and Elizabeth Elliot said and did. In Job chapter 42 and verse 10, you don't need to turn there, it says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. And I've got to put quotes around it, even though it's not in the Hebrew or the English of the Old Testament. His friends, they were some fine friends, weren't they? Have you ever read the book of Job, all 42 chapters? Have you ever read about those friends, those fine friends that, that uh, Job had? They were not fine friends. But the scripture says, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for those people that gave him such a hard time. He's got every kind of skin and body inflamed, swollen issue. I mean, the boils are from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. He's in pain, he's in sackcloth, and he's in ashes. He's in the city dump. And they come around and they say, now you might have done something that you forgot about. You must have done something because only people that do things end up like this. God only does that to people that are guilty. I want to ask you the question, would you have loved them enough to pray for them after all of that? Do we love the Lord enough to pray for His enemies and for our enemies? We need to be praying for them. The highest, the greatest love in a tangible way. Let's pray for those that we love and those we like and those that we don't love and those that we don't like, but let's love them in a tangible way by praying for them. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Every head bowed, every eye closed. You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross, he was buried, he rose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this. Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire 
more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.